hereby invite uh, our convener Shimla Raja Basin for engagement of youth for heritage protection. Don't worry, sir. I'll clip it. I shall race through as quickly as I can. So uh, allow me to dispense with the niceties and the preliminaries and come straight to what I was talking about. All through the background of uh, my talk, uh, all through the background of my talk will be these images running of Himachal, what we have, what we are trying to preserve. We have seen an enormous amount of stuff which we've lost. I am going to be looking at things which we have and what we seek to preserve. There are a couple of things which are, there's a cue which I've taken from Dr. Muhammad and also from Arun here, is that uh, how, several years ago, long before I was connected with INTAC, uh, I was on a government assignment and we were, I had been commissioned to assist in drafting a new tourism policy. In that, I had been given the great symbol of power of those days, a white ambassador with government number plates, which carried me through wherever I wanted to go. I was at this old temple in one of the more remote areas. My driver, Karam Singh, he says, Saab, aapko kuch achha lagta hai, rakh andar. I don't know how my expression, uh, uh, what sort of an expression I had. And he says, nahi, nahi, koi nahi rokega. Aap choose any piece lying from this temple, any old carving. It's just about 800 years ago. I'll put it in the dicky, take it home. And uh, uh, so again, going back to my expression, he says, nahi, sab karte hai. So this is what the Paris, the New York, how things were moving out. Uh, when we come to Himachal, it's a unique culture, which goes for the rest of our country also. There are two, three things which remain here. One is that you remove its natural beauty, you remove its heritage, you're left with nothing. There is no industry, there is no means of livelihood. The geographic isolation of this state has been enormous. We have four very clear geographic zones, the outer fringe of the Shivalik Hills, the lesser or the middle Himalaya, the greater Himalaya, and then the waste of the trans Himalaya. We have three very clear cultural zones, the outer fringe of the lower districts, which are mainstream North Indian states, very similar in terms to Jammu Kashmir, uh, especially to Jammu, and to the states of Punjab and Haryana. We move into the mid hills, the presence of local deities and local shamanism emerges within local practices. We cross into the trans Himalaya, the presence of Vajrayan Buddhism emerges and is a very, very strong presence there. In my engagement with uh, the younger lot, we come across one fundamental question. Why should they preserve? Is it an indulgence? Is it a question of home, identity and belonging? These were the first questions which we tried to address. Unlike many other parts of the country, the abject poverty which we see in other parts of the country is absent in Himachal. Himachal is not a poor state. Almost everybody has means, livelihood, land, a place to live in, food to eat. If you do not have that, there's a very simple answer to that. You are dead. The cold will kill you. Uh, so these things are very fundamental to all these things. At the same time, there is a fair bit of migration out from the villages looking for livelihoods. In my engagement with some of the younger people which have come out of the villages and are in the towns, the first response is, Badi mushkal se gaon se nikle hain, humne wapas nahi jana. Why? The livelihoods are absent in the villages. They do not want to go back to the farming. They're all become educated. Unfortunately, an aspect of that education is they now no longer want to deal in the cow sheds. They do no longer want to go back into the farms and do the, the work. All of them, not all of them, a fair bit of them are looking now is for white collar transformations from that village life. There are no uh, proper studies, but there is enough anecdotal evidence to suggest that if livelihoods were appear in those villages, those youngsters would go back or stay in their villages. 
in my own life, I have trekked, I have walked mountains, literally mountains, I've slept in people's verandas, I've done a study living in a polyandrous home, and for those who are not familiar with it, it's a form of, well, marriage, where one woman with several husbands, uh, things like that, which have made me as grassroots as one can get. There are two very basic things which we look for when we look for employment, status and money. It will be a very rare thing which will emerge as a third. These are the two fundamental things which we look for. Heritage preservation, if it can dovetail with this, that is the only thing which will attract people to it. I have been given this phrase from many of the younger boys and girls, that this heritage guide or heritage preserver doesn't call us. Call us heritage commandos. It's a bit over the top, but maybe that's an aspirational thing which they do want to have. When I've been looking at my own children, taking them to different places as they were young, the first thing would be, what sort of a holiday is this? You take us to one pile of stones, then you take us to another pile of stones. We've seen enough piles of stones, don't take us to more piles of stones. How do we make it interesting? How do we make this transformation which will bring these children, uh, which will make them interesting? Arun had some very valid points, and I'm trying to go a little uh, on the same lines. In this thing, we found, I found in, the, in my experience, I very clearly divide them into three categories. The youngest children, which are pre-teens, they are engaged with stories, with visuals, with that hands-on approach, like holding a flower, holding a plant, speaking about it. One little plant which grows in these, at this point of time, is uh, the impatiens flower. The pod forms of something like, a, almost like a tiny pea pod. But if you touch it, it explodes and this sends the seeds out. You ask a child to touch that pod and he feels that little cracker bursting in his hand, it suddenly makes him more interested in whatever is happening. Similarly, you have is the stinging nettle growing there. You warn the child about the stinging nettle, that the stinging nettle stings because it is acidic. Next to that, this is nature synergy for you, next to that, is what grows is the wild dock leaf, which is the antidote to the plant, and it is an antidote simply because it is alkaline. How nature is giving you its examples, sitting there right in front of you. The second lot of children, which are slightly older, they look at it at a level of entertainment, which should be explained with both data and fact. The third, who may become actual practitioners in heritage, pra preservation, we look at careers and livelihoods first. It is not, uh, they cannot look at heritage preservation as a little bit of an indulgence. Uh, two or three examples which I have with which I'm going to, and which, with which I'm going to wrap up, is that uh, one of those villages that I stayed in is a small village called Janjeli, which is now going through a major transformation across the hills. Uh, I had a very unusual dish there, which I think I've never eaten before, rajma meat. So with kidney beans, meat was cooked. And I ended up talking with the man who ran that little place. It was a regular dhaba. Next to him was the only concrete structure in that entire village, which was the Yuko Bank. So he says, I am planning to knock down this beautiful wooden structure that I have and one day I will make something like this. I said, why would you want to do something so terrible? He says, but everybody wants that. It is also local aspiration, and it is also our lack of being able to explain that maybe somebody from an urban setting is looking more for a rural setting, but perhaps with a good bathroom, good housekeeping, and a good kitchen. Strangely enough, the COVID has given a boom to an aspect of tourism is the homestays. The homestays, which is also a policy of the government, which I was very closely involved in, in formulating, was done only to provide is a means of supplemental livelihoods to people in the villages. But during the COVID months, all those homestays are full. 
people, the, the digital nomad has gone to these little villages. He's living there. He's running his work, his business out of a remote village, sometimes a few miles from any road. He's doing it at a fraction of the cost of a rent, say, he would be pay, paying in any one of the metro cities. This is a major transformation, again, happening. This is where another aspect of heritage preservation is emerging. And at this time, I also would like to mention something which we've been talking about, is that, half a minute, uh, is that what we've been talking about, that uh, uh, stepping away from all this, we've had also examples of how initiatives of ours have gone wrong. We did the Kalka Simla clean up. We cleaned the entire track. We had about 12,000 volunteers working on it, from the army, from the territorial army, from the bar councils, from children. Today you go back, the track is as filthy as ever. So it's a disillusioning experience. This is what the youngsters get disillusioned with. I leave you with a couple of images which I'm very rapidly going to go through. Unfortunately, I wish I had more time to explain what this is all about. But as they say, there's always another day. Thank you. For giving us the innovative method for engagement of the youth.